Thank you very much for your presentation and good morning to everybody. Uh, so I'm very glad I can share with you today some ideas on several methods in uh, translation history. Um, as you will see, I will present two models uh, and uh, two case studies and I wonder what you will think about them and maybe uh, also the way you could adopt them in your classroom or if you want also in your own research. Um, I'm very grateful to Mirna uh, for her talk of yesterday because you delivered very valuable connection points to what I'm going to say today. So, um, in my lecture, sorry, I have to organize myself. No, no. I'm wondering. Flip it around. Just in time. Sorry, I have to put it the other way. No, no it's working. Okay, thank you. Now, in my lecture, I will first discuss some general problems inherent to the research in the history of translation, such as periodization, the nation boundness of research, and the Western bias uh, in the study of translation history. The thorough discussion of these assumptions will bring me to articulate some research questions which will signal this uh, highly topical interest scholars unquestionably have in translation history over the last few years. Most importantly, I will then focus on two research models. First, Histoire Croisée, as mainly developed by Benedict Zimmermann and Michael Berner, and Irving Goffman's dramaturgical model, um, and uh, a case study on Russian, uh, in Russian prisoners of war in the First World War, and another one on military translation uh, cultures in German prisoners of war in Finland during the Second World War uh, will then elucidate, hopefully, the strong potential offered by these models. So, let me come uh, to my main assumptions, which are underlying so much research in translation history. As we know, in the past decade or so, translation history has emerged as a clearly defined subdiscipline of translation and interpreting studies. Uh, so we can witness not only a great and further increasing number of publications, but also vast academic activities such as conferences or undergraduate or even graduate programs which testify to the importance given to the topic. Yet, I think that despite all these research and teaching activities, it seems as if the methodologies adopted in translation history research are still a rather uncharted field. So why translation history has a bearing in translation studies and which forces are at its basis can be seen in the following example. In 1937, the Soviet Union celebrated Pushkin's centennial by translating his poem, Eugene Onegin, uh, into all languages of the USSR. Samet Vurgun, who translated the poem into the Azerbaijani language, was awarded with the Pushkin Medal and later became a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He received two Stalin Prizes, etc. While his Kazakh colleague, Ilash Changurov, was persecuted for political reasons and was shot in 1937. So, this example seems relevant for various reasons. First, it shows us, once again, that translation is not innocent. The political and the ideological implications of translating in general and in certain periods, uh, historical periods in, particu in particular, tell us that translation can be an important and at times also life-threatening phenomenon which contributes to shaping the societies where translation becomes effective. Secondly, it seems as if it is not so much the quality of translation that counts, but rather the context. 
and contexts, as we know, never happen ahistorically, but are mostly motivated and they are very firmly rooted in historically construed surroundings. Now let me come to the assumptions I have mentioned. They can be considered, did this will happen? Okay. Now let me come to the assumptions I have mentioned before. They can be considered as a kind of reference frame for most discussions on translation history because the implicit or also the explicit choice uh, how to handle this cluster of concerns determines always the nature of subsequent insights from the research we do. So first, periodization. We come across periodization in books on the history of translation which try to arrange translation events and translators across history along certain periods. In our own research, we very often need periodization to bring some order in the data uh, we have retrieved from different sources. So periodization, without doubt, helps us to structure the events of the past and therefore also our historical mind map. The dividing lines are mostly those offered by the categories of space and time. So most periodization patterns show a diachronic structure rather than a synchronic one. This of course entails a, a series of consequences including, as especially José Lambert has taught us, the tendency, I quote, to homogenize the material and to provide it with a teleological orientation. So one stage of development follows the other in an apparently endless sequence. Lieven Dülst, one of the major translator historians in translation history, um, asks what are the criteria and the problems they arise which are used for periodization. So is it age or century or um, a certain period? Is it a generation or is it the avant-garde? There might be many other um, um, a criteria like this. Or in addition, there are some parameters which can be used such as the beginnings of fan subbing or uh, political and cultural ones such as after and before the Nazi regime or the Second World War or the rise of feminism and many others. Uh, one of the problems we encounter when we use such uh, parameters is that the concepts or the terms uh, which we use uh, often do not correspond to others used in other cultures or also in other disciplines. See, for instance, Geisteswissenschaften in German versus humanities in the English-speaking world, which is something quite different. Or Enlightenment in France, Siècle des Lumières, versus Enlightenment in Spain, Illustration, to quote just a few examples. In any case, periodization often appears to be arbitrary or at times even inaccurate. Uh, the concept of century, for instance, has been denounced by a number of historians. Yet, it is largely used in periodizations undertaken by some of the most celebrated translation history scholars, such as George Steiner, Michel Bayard, or Julio Cesar Santoyo. Santoyo, for instance, proposed four phases. The first phase of oral translation extends from prehistory to 3000 BC. A second of written translation is determined from 2400 BC to Cicero. The period when reflections on translation arises stretches from Cicero to the end of the 18th century. And real theorization begins, according to Santoyo, with Teitler in 1791 and Schleiermacher and lasts into the 80s of the 20th century when Santoyo made his proposal. So the periodization which he suggested presents some pitfalls such as the opposition from oral to written or the initiation of a period with the work of a certain person. Uh, so my question is if such distinctions are valid and can they used 
as a base, as a foundation. In other words, can there be considered due, really true categories that now allow for the analysis of structure? Periodizations, and I agree with Clara Foss in this, in this, uh, in this point, present uh, translation practices within a certain continuity. So this continuity sometimes confines them to idealization. They assimilate, in a sense, the phenomena into a linear movement, a succession of events which does not allow to see us uh, the ruptures and interruptions which take place. Today we rather see the object of translation as moving and changing and it's influenced by many, many different paradigms, be it linguistic, cultural or social or performative. Thus, uh, today we see translation no longer as given but as a construct, as a sort of resemblance as we have heard these days. At the same time, they are structured by translation scholars into categories which themselves have a history, the scholars themselves, and are based on different interests and power relations. I think, again with Clara Foss, the time has come to critically reassess these categories. So one of these categories is the concept of nation. What is the problem about nation? The problem about nation is obvious, but uh, what is its problem, especially in the context of translation history, where it is so much or so widely used? My second assumption is that nation-bound research prevents us from focusing on the shifts between cultures, so a view which is inherent to our research on translation, so also on the continuous flow uh, of cultures or societies, especially once we see them construed through translation. We encounter national views, for instance, in chapters of encyclopedias like the Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies. In the various traditions, as they are called, we detect a whole mixture of concepts. See, for instance, the African tradition implying a whole continent versus the American tradition, which America, which of the various Americas, versus the German tradition, and my question is, does it only start with the formation of the German Reich in the 19th century, or where are other German-speaking countries than Germany? Together with most European nation-bound um, traditions like Spain, Italy, or Poland, with reference to Poland and its ever-changing borders, we can ask um, in which period, which period does it refer to? So, are the traditions bound to language or are they bound to a geographical space? This example shows us the problematic of nation in all its facets. Of course, it is true that we all have a very critical eye on nation-bound historiographies, but which alternatives do we really have? First, we can ask what discourses on nation are generated or are also, of course, perpetuated through translation and which other discourses support or subvert these ones. Another possibility is to transcend such clear-cut views is the thinking in the in-between, so between uh, cultures and in transcultures, which opens all the spaces of reinterpretation of the fluid, of the shifting between cultures. In such a way we can perhaps go beyond thinking in nation-bound contexts. The problem I have just discussed here is very closely connected to the next one, to the last assumption I want to share with you, and that is the Western bias. The East-West divide is a permanent feature of translation's history. It has been rapidly, uh, repeatedly challenged by several scholars over the last few years, but it seems as if it is very difficult to eradicate it. There is little wonder. Western thinking has dominated the not only historical discourse over the last few centuries. First of all, what is Western? Both East and West always imply perspective and position. East of what? 
west of what? How near is the Near East? How far is the Far East? And near and far of what? What is the west of the Western USA? Asia? So is Asia Western or Eastern? In the Chinese tradition, where China can be seen as the Middle Kingdom, India is the West, but of course not for Imperial Britain. So generally, East and West become concepts with Europe in the center. So roughly the term Western refers to ideas and it refers to perspectives that initially originated in and became dominant in Europe, spreading from there to various other locations in the world. Um, an example uh, well illustrates the problem of Eastern and Western perspectives, um, which is the term Völkerwanderung. This period was a time, as we know, of widespread migrations of people, notably the so-called Germanic tribes, within or into Europe in the, first, in the middle of the first uh, millennium. In English, you either use the term Völker, the German term Völkerwanderung, or you say equally harmless migration period or great migration. In Croatian and Serbian, <coughs> you say Seoba Naroda, which means migration of the peoples. In Spanish, interestingly, you say Invasión de los Bárbaros. In Italian, Migrazione dei Popoli or Invasione Barbarica. In Chinese, Sorry, I cannot pronounce it. The first term means big movement of Germanic people, or the other term, big movement of Asian grassland people. So again, a totally different perspective. It thus seems that according to the perspective of those who are involved into this Wanderung, this migration, from whatever standpoint, the term historically constructs, constructs our memory and our way of thinking, and it provides the basis for further historical interpretations. Some people believe that now, in the age of so-called globalization and the interpenetration of cultures, the term East and West have become increasingly superfluous or at best problematic. I would claim that in most public discourses, the Western thinking in a while has had its upper hand. In translation studies, several scholars have, have persistently tried to relocate the Western and Eastern bias by arguing in favor of a more integrative, non-Eurocentric and inter international discipline. I agree with Martha Chung when she, when she says that, I quote, in order to go beyond Eurocentric and Sinocentric views, what is needed is not just a new mindset, but more material for study and for comparison. But our knowledge about this topic is yet very patchy. One of the perhaps most radical ways to transcend binary oppositions is deconstructing them. This means focusing on the process and not fostering the East-West divide by promoting one of the two. Rather, we could ask what are the exchange activities between the various cultures involved, what are the processes or perhaps events which triggered the awareness of the other through translation or interpreting. So what counts would be rather the motives and also the implications of cultural transfers and not what were the developments in the various cultures. What is on the move is thus important and not what stabilizes a culture, in our case through translation. Let me now come to various sets of research questions which we could ask on the basis of these remarks. I will formulate them primarily on the basis of the question what could be done in order to transcend these paradigms. So we could ask, for example, in which way are cultures reconstructed or reformulated through translation? The Habsburg monarchy could be a case in point for this question. Studying translation in the context of the empire's 
pluriculturality. This implies, of course, also to other multilingual empires like the Ottoman Empire or uh, the Soviet Union. It sheds new light on the spheres of influence on the various cultures which are involved and reveals the very intricate relations between the cultures which built up, in this case, the monarchy. Regarding methodology, we can ask a series of important questions. What methodologies can help to transcend the historiography which still foregrounds the national identities of mediators? Related to this question, we could ask how can notions like the translator and interpreter as an intercultural mediator and other questions of interculturality, how can they be linked with conceptual models elaborated in cultural studies such as hybridity or metissage? <clears throat> More specifically, how and to what extent can we adopt concepts like Hayden White's view of history uh, as a narrative prose discourse or Carlo Ginsburg, Ginsburg's concept of microhistory, or Histoire Croisée uh, with Michael Werner, and so on. And what are the prevailing culture-specific discourses that manifest themselves in the description of the history of translation and interpreting, and of translators and interpreters? Such discourses are not only culture-bound, as we know, but they are very deeply endowed in ideological constraints, according always to the period when they are created and the media by which they are distributed. Another question could be, when attempting to conceptualize a methodological framework for translation and interpreting history, in which ways can we benefit from the methodologies developed in historical studies or historiography on the basis of a postmodern and post-structuralist perspective, including issues like otherness, ideology, power, or ethnicity. The list can, of course, continue, be continued. I will now come to the discussion of the first model I want to present you today, and this is the uh, approach of Histoire Croisée. As you know, Histoire Croisée has been developed in historical studies in the course of debates over various established theoretical methods such as comparative history or cultural transfer approaches. Uh, I can't go into detail here, but um, uh, this model, this uh, approach tries to overcome uh, transfer and especially comparativism. As a response to the critical points which were raised uh, according to these approaches, or in, in the wake of these approaches, and in view of the very accelerated processes of internationalization, and renewed debates also on uh, globalization, we can witness a new stress on transnational approaches to history, among them Histoire Croisée. So the concept of Histoire Croisée has been developed by uh, Michael Werner and Benedikt Zimmermann. They are both from the École des Autétudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. As the term suggests, histoire croisée, crossed histories, what counts is the intercrossing of perspectives uh, and a transnational view on history which tries to transcend the biases I have, um, uh, I have discussed earlier. In more detail, this approach invites us to reconsider the interactions between different societies and cultures, erudit disciplines of traditions, and more specifically between social and cultural productions. Or, as Werner and Zimmermann say, I quote, Histoire Croisée focuses on empirical enlacements consubstantial with the object of study, as well as on the opera operations by which researchers themselves cross scales, categories, and viewpoints. So, in the Histoire Croisée approach, it is not primarily crucial what is enlaced, but the way of enlacement. The main concern of Histoire Croisée is 
that it does not take uh, account of fixed categories such as, for example, a certain translation product or a certain constraint laid upon uh, translators or interpreters, but problems and questions which are subject to certain evolvements during the process of analysis. So the process of analysis is in the center of Histoire Croisée. This means that this approach identifies a strong relationship between the object or process to be analyzed, for instance, a translation process, and the researcher's position, which is crucial in this case. So, for instance, uh, the researcher's motivations uh, which are behind of doing a certain research. Thank you so much. Exactly. Uh, secondly, Histoire Croisée analyzes concrete objects like institutions, legal systems, cultural products or disciplines and not of given models or global constructs such as a nation or a culture or a society. Thirdly, very important, it focuses on the level of the agents involved. This means on the conflicts they operate in and the strategies adopted to develop solutions. As we can see, these concerns are all central to the analysis of the translation or interpreting process, including both the actors involved in all its different stages and the translation or the uh, interpreting product. So the process of enlacement is conditioned by various dimensions. One, that it is continuously created anew because it takes place between already enlaced objects. This implies that the objects are, we, which we analyze, they are subject to a permanent transformation during and on behalf of the enlacement, which generally takes place, moreover, in asymmetrical uh, constellations. In the translation context, this would mean, as we know, that translations or also interpretations we analyze can be viewed and interpreted differently according to the time when it is done and according to the historical context, concept, context in which the uh, analysis takes place. As a result, we have to distinguish between various levels of enlacement. One that is between the objects, another enlacement between the various perspectives which control the view on these enlaced objects, and the enlacement of the analytical practices of the researcher. I will come back to these stages later on. This eventually, which is very important for the Isvakoze approach, as you will have already uh, noted, discloses the very self-reflexive nature of this approach, which will be illustrated in an example. Um, a last point for Werner and Zimmermann, the constituents of the enlacement process are manifold. Typological factors include observations and viewpoints, which for the translational context could mean various perspectives on the phenomenon of translation or interpreting and their reflection across space and time. Or abstract objects such as economic systems, educational systems, or also if you want the tradition of, traditions of ideas, which in translation or interpreting can be related to the consideration of political and aesthetic tradi traditions of thought and concrete objects, objects such as texts, which in translation studies are mostly the very object of the discipline. Last uh, but not least, we have human beings, the last and perhaps most important group of constituents. In our case, these are translators and all other agents, if you want also institutions, which are involved in the translation or interpreting process, and they create a very um, fit tissue of multifold relationships. So I will now present a case study by adopting this um, Histoire Croisée approach. My case study deals with a Ukrainian prisoner of war and draws on a historical account. This account was written by the 
Finnish historian Lars Westerlund in 2008. Its title is, I tell you the English translation, it's very difficult to pronounce it in Finnish. The English translation is German prisoners of war camps in Finland and in border areas 1941 to 44. In Westerlund's report, the Ukrainian prisoner Mikhail escapes from a German prisoner of war camp. To remember, Finland, until 1944, collaborated with the German Wehrmacht. After being recaptured by Finnish headhunters, Mikhail is shot in front of other camp inmates as a warning. As his last words, he shouts, Hai Jive Radianska Ukraina, which means long live Soviet Ukraine. So a quite politically loaded message. The German officer in charge asks the interpreter to interpret the message into German. The interpreter obviously does not talk openly about Mikhail's patriotic thoughts and so says, says that the executed prisoner bade farewell to the other inmates, uh, to the other prisoners of war um, of the camp. So instead of a more or less faithful interpretation as expected, especially in the military context, the German officer is provided with nothing more than a speech act with which the interpreter uses his very, very minimal power. In so doing, the interpreter positions himself on the side of the executed man's fellow captives. What might be the reason for his strategy? Perhaps the simple reason because he wanted to protect his fellow inmates? We do not know which army the interpreter served. Yet we know that in German camps for Soviet prisoners of war, there were some Finnish or German military interpreters among the guard personnel. To a much greater extent, however, the mediation process was forced upon to bilingual prisoners of war born, for example, in Germany or in German-speaking countries of Ukraine or in the Baltic countries. Therefore, it might also be true that in the execution scene, other reasons come into play, such as loyalty to the interpreter's own nationality or political sympathy with the executed prisoner's political stance. Now, before I will adopt the Istuakwase approach to the analysis of the interpreting scene, I would like to discuss uh, the broader context of this situation. The interpreting setting is undoubtedly military interpreting, as the setting as such is located in the military context and prisoner of war camps were certainly administered or run according to military rules. Now, which are the main peculiarities of military interpreting? It's important to understand in order to understand the scene we are analyzing. One of the specificities refers to the sensitive position of military interpreters. Their work in general, their duties, the information they get are most of the time of a highly secret nature. So discretion and um, confidentiality are of paramount importance for the military interpreting context and are often connected to questions of life and death, as we know. In any case, forwarding or suppressing secret information, also on behalf of military interpreters, can represent a security risk for the whole military division. I will come back to the question of secret later on. Secondly, as we know, military interpreters are often engaged in interrogations of war prisoners. During interrogations, nonverbal signs which help to understand communicative processes are of extreme importance. To give an example, it might happen that the person interrogated consciously gives misinformation. Understanding his or her nonverbal signs might help finding out whether the person tells the truth or not. Equally, accuracy is another important feature during the interrogation of war prisoners. Furthermore, in many cases, military interpreters are asked to fulfill duties which are not directly linked to the activity as interpreters. For instance, 
He might be asked to write the minutes of an interrogation or to produce a transcript of an oral interrogation into a written one. On the language of level, on the level of language or register, military interpreters are very often called to understand a very broad array of dialects and varieties of the languages in question. And one of the basic requirements of the military interpreting profession is the readiness to subordinate to the military hierarchy and to receive and execute military orders. Another set of characteristics is the interpreter's role as a go-between, also in the military context. I will come back to this role also later on. Generally, there are, we can distinguish between two main clusters of features which characterize the military interpreting activity. One is the fact that in many cases the activity is carried out in life dangerous, uh, dangering uh, situations and the extremely high death rate in the Iraq war illustrates the, this very high occupational risk. Only in the five years between 2003 and 2008 360 military interpreters were killed and more than 1,200 injured. The death rate in the Afghanistan war is still higher. So the other cluster refers to the notoriously negative image of the interpreting activity in general, which is loaded also on the shoulders of the military interpreters. So their potential functions as spies, traitors, falsifiers, or, or collaborationists, among many other attributed roles. So as we can see, this arsenal of features which characterizes the military um, interpreter's activity is particularly broad. But let me now come to the analysis of the interpreting situation I have presented earlier and I want to analyze it with the histoire croise approach. At a closer look, we might identify various perspectives. First, the objects to be analyzed in the present context involve particularly the interpreting situation <coughs> and the various participating agents and institutions which deliver the thicker context of this situation. That is, the Ukrainian prisoner Mikhail, the camp inmates, the German officer, the interpreter, the Finnish, Finnish headhunters, as well as the camp and the army institutions. This perspective thus presents an ensemble of objects who or which converge in the interpreting situation which follow Mikhail's execution. The dynamics of this interpreting situation are primar primarily conditioned by the atmosphere of violence dominating the scene. The, the enlacement is particularly revealed in the crossing of the different levels where the agents involved are being staged. Mikhail, at the moment of his execution, his fellow inmates being forced to watch the scene, the German officer struggling to linguistically understand what is going on, and the interpreter who shifts between different levels that of the Ukrainian ideological stance and that of military obedience. Another perspective results from the dynamic exchange modes with um, other social, political and cultural environments. In the present case, this might apply to the ideological constraints placed upon the camp interpreter or by the strict rules placed upon the soldier or the soldiers who executed Mikhail. A third perspective is that of the author. By which motivations might Westerlund have been driven? Perhaps the motivation behind his perspective can be reconstructed from the usage of his sources. Did he get his relevant information from archival material or through oral history? or private letters, or memoirs, or interviews? And which were the selection criteria? And is his account rather historical, or is it perhaps also or exclusively fictionalized? 
A fourth perspective is uh, that of co is the researcher's one. The research okay, it's, it's me. The researcher's <laughs> perspective is that of controlling, willingly or not, the emphasis of the various elements of information that nourish the scene. Where is his or her, where is my focus? Is it on the agents and their potential motivation to act as observable units in this interpreting scene? Or is it on the terrifying moments of the execution? This makes a big difference. And what is the researcher's bias? Is it the value of military loyalty or the absurdity of war? So this makes a whole difference when um, uh, the scene is um, analyzed. So what seems particularly relevant is the enlacement of the various participating objects. The method proposed involves several elements which mold our understanding of the interpreting scene on the bias on the basis of this enlacement. And this means the instance of terror, arbitrariness and of course also of panic we can see in this scene and which seem quite characteristic for this scene can be brought to the fore particularly through an emphasis on the moment of enlacement. The passive or active participation in the scene on behalf of the agents, the institutions, the author and the researcher, they allow all for a very strong dynamics. And these dynamics, on the other hand, they are simultaneously nourished and blocked. The dynamics are nourished because to the reader and to the researcher all kind of interpretation and of imagination of the scene is open and they are blocked because we just do not have the necessary information on the motivation why the interpreter delivered a misinterpretation of Mikhail's last words before he was killed. So to sum up what counts in the histoire croisé approach is the permanent move between the various perspectives and its inherent potential also to create or better construct new views on the research object. So I will now come to my second model, um, which is the dramaturgical model by Irving Goffman, uh, many of you might know. Um, in his The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, which appeared already in 1959, it has been republished uh, many, many times and in many translations until today, the Canadian-born sociologist Goffman argues that social life can be equaled with the stage. So in different settings of communication, each individual, according to Goffman, each individual acts and interacts according to specific patterns of behavior which are determined by the social role this individual takes on. This role reflects the societal relations for the individual and it is bound to certain normative expect expectations. For instance, a judge, judge is associated with neutrality, an accountant with accuracy and so on. Goffman thought that his metaphors for, or he, saw, he thought his uh, metaphors for social roles and for the individuals involved directly from the theater. Thus, in his so-called dramaturgical model, he elaborates on social life as a staged drama. We are all part of a drama. In this drama, there are several features he highlights. First, the actors. We have to distinguish between those who perform, those performed to, so the audience, and the outsiders who neither perform in the show nor observe it, but they nevertheless are part of the drama. Goffman calls groups of actors an ensemble. Secondly, there is the role of each individual involved in the drama. Each individual has a certain social role. I will discuss the function of these roles later on. Thirdly, the so-called secrets, they are important ingredients of his theory and they condition the functioning of the drama. For those who work with Bourdieu, 
the concept of secret bears very similar traits to Bourdieu's habitus. Then we have the terms front stage and backstage. These are the regions on the stage where the individuals operate and between which they always shift. And finally, there is the facade, which Goffman sees as a repertoire of means of expression that underlies any interaction. Now, let me discuss uh, two of these features in a bit more detail, the role and the secrets. Um, so, in a drama, each individual performs a certain role in society, which varies according to the audience. Actors play a role in a drama. This is not new, of course. In society, Goffman tells us, actors play their role in an intentional and in a manipulative way. Their aim is to manage others' impressions of them. They want to manage, the, to, to control the impressions which they uh, want to give on other, other agents. In such a context, he depicts three different roles. One is on the basis of function. That is, who of those who interact has which function? And in which way are these functions also deployed? Secondly, on the basis of information, what kind of information do the various actors or performers have? What can they dispose of? Once they are aware of the kind of degree of information they have, they are aware of the impression they can foster. This means that their manipulative potential is then activated. On the other hand, the, on the, other hand, the audience knows or understands from the performance what they have been allowed to perceive and what they have not been allowed to perceive. So it's a very manipulative act, as we can see. Thirdly, roles are depicted on the basis of the regions, or better, on the stages to which the role player or performer has access. Performers appear in the front and in the backstage. I will show you the picture. The audience appears only in the front stage, and the outsiders are excluded from both stages. In addition, Goffman distinguishes between various so-called discrepant roles. These appear quite complex, but they are particularly relevant for our analysis. First, there is the role of the informer. He or she is someone who pretends to the performers to be a member of the team, is allowed to come backstage and then openly or secretly sells out uh, the show to the audience often playing a very double game. Goffman stresses that the political, mil military and also criminal uh, variants of this role are quite famous, so informers are often called traitors. Secondly, there is the role of the shill. Shill is a person who praises something or someone for reasons of self-interest. So in Goffman terms, a shill acts as if he were an ordinary member of the audience, but is in fact in connection with the performers. Another and for us most important discrepant role is that of the go-between or mediator. The go-between, so very often the interpreter, learns the secrets, which I will explain in a second, of each side and gives each side the true impression that he or she will keep these secrets gives this impression to both sides. But he tends to give each side the false impression to be more loyal to it than to the other. Sometimes, as is the case of the theatrical agent, the go-between may function as a means by which each side is given a slanted version of the other that is calculated to make a closer relationship between the two sides possible. As an individual, the go-betweens uh, go activity is always bizarre, it is untenable and it is undignified, as Goffman says, and it vacillates from one side, from one set of loyalties to the other. Finally, we have the term of secret, which is part of Goffman's tool set. Secrets belong to the functioning of the game. They help control the information between the various social roles. 
We have dark secrets. They refer to facts about a team which it knows and conceals and which is incompatible with the image the team attempts to maintain before its audience. There are strategic secrets. They pertain to intentions and to capacities of a team. And the team conceals these secrets from its audience in order to prevent them from adapting effectively to the state of affairs the team is planning to bring about. So they are the ones, for example, that armies employ in designing future actions against the enemy. Thirdly, there are inside secrets. They mark an individual as being a member of the group. And finally, the entrusted secrets. This is the kind which the possessor is obliged to keep because of his relation to the team to which the secret refers. Now let me illustrate uh, and discuss the various key features of Goffman's model in a short case study. This photo features Russian, Russian prisoners being interrogated by German officers and an interpreter at the beginning of the First World War. This is also the content of the caption which says in English translation, the Russian invasion in Eastern Prus Prussia, 1914, called up. Russian prisoners being interrogated by interpreter and officers of the general staff. According to the caption, the location is called up, a small Polish town that today lies on the border with Lithuania. During the First World War, it was the scene of fierce fighting on the so-called Eastern Front. After the outbreak of war in 1914, the Russian westward movement was very rapid, but quite inefficient due to communication and also to logistical problems within the Imperial Russian Army. So a first push, a first Russian push into, the, uh, into East Prussia was promptly followed by the devastation of the Second Russian Army at the Battle of Tannenberg. It may be assumed that the picture was taken in the wake of this battle. The back of the postcard tells us that the photo was taken by the court photographer A. Kühlewind, official war photographer in Königsberg, today's Kaliningrad, a fact that supports the view of the postcard as a propaganda medium intended to persuade the German uh, civilian population of their army supremacy and its very masterly handling of situations like the one uh, we see on the postcard. So when we recall Goffman's analytical tools, also with the help um, of what I have said before, what do we see on the picture? Which actors can we identify? Which roles? How many stages can we identify? Which secrets do we understand are playing, are having their, um, their a role in this, in this uh, photograph? And how is the drama staged? So, um, according to Goffman's dramaturgical model, um, each individual, as I said before, plays a role, and as we have said, uh, this is always in an intentional and usual manipulative way uh, with the aim of managing others' impressions as part of a team. So in the context of this postcard, the institutionalized interpreting activity takes place on what Goffman calls the front stage, the zone where the ensemble meets the audience. That stage is constituted by the long row of Russian prisoners who appear to be frightened. Maybe I can show you the picture again. Who appear to be frightened, yet also curious about the role apparently being imposed on them through the photographing process. However, the German officers opposite the prisoners are also part of the front stage. They convey a complacent impression. They are obviously satisfied with their early military success and perhaps they are barriers of entrusted secrets, secrets they are obliged to keep 
in order to maintain the team's integrity. So in this case, the secret of the possible prisoner's future fate. The picture poses the interpreter in the center between the two opposing groups. He is a young officer who holds his hands crossed, a gesture which might signal insecurity and maybe also lack of experience. It could also be an attempt to intimate reluctance in order to avoid a deeper involvement in the scene. Or perhaps it is simply a cold day, we don't know. Yet this interpreter certainly knows very well uh, that he must maintain the facade, uh, which Kaufman sees, as I told you, as a repertoire of means of expression that underlies any kind of interaction. When an actor opts for a certain social role, as the interpreter, he or she will be aware that for that role a certain facade already exists and must be fulfilled according to the expectations of the, uh, of the other uh, actors involved. So in this picture, the interpreter's social role is twofold. As well as interpreting the officer's questions, he's keeping apart the two groups. The German officers on the one side with their tidy uniforms and their self-assured gestures and the rather poorly dressed Russian prisoners on the other side characterized by concern and by fear. So the first group figures Western European civilization, the latter Slavdom and Asianness. The interpreter is positioned at the fault line uh, of the stage drama in an in-between space. As a go-between, in Goffman's sense, the interpreter understands both sides and hypothetically has access to each side's knowledge. Goffman tells us that the activity of the go-between as an individual is, as I have already mentioned, bizarre, untenable and undignified. And it's vacillating from one set of loyalties to the other. Here, however, the picture outwardly suggests that the young German officer's concern is limited to his role as mediator for his own people only, who have certain expectations of his performance and physically back him in his endeavor to satisfy the task. So let me come back to... So from the audience's point of view, the vanishing lines locate the interpreter at the very key position of the photo, making him the person upon whom the, uh, all the picture's tensions converges. The photographer thus positions himself in such a way as to focus the entire responsibility for the scene's discourse on this interpreter. The group of soldiers on the left are, in government terms, backstage, they are not openly participating in the scene, but they are holders of entrusted secrets, which they are obliged to keep because of their relationship with the team to which the secret refers. So, as we have seen, Goffman's dramaturgical model appears particularly apt to analyze military interpreting situations. Let me analyze the interpreting situation in the German prisoners of war camp in the Second World War I was discussing before, which followed Michael's execution uh, with Goffman's model now. So my focus will be here on the interpreter. What strikes in Goffman's model is the changeability of the social roles and especially the shifting between the performer group and the audience. The interpreter as a go-between, a mediator, as delineated by Goffman, is a case in point for this idea. First, the interpreting situation appears as a scene in Goffman's sense and it is orchestrated on different stages. On the one hand, the front stage, where the institutionalized interpreting activity takes place, as we know, as we have heard, between the German officer and the camp interpreter. In action, in action. This action is the execution which is regarded as legal by the Wehrmacht. On the other, the interpreter, pretending not to have understood Michael's words rightly, performs on the backstage in an obviously secret understanding with the camp inmates or perhaps other people involved in the scene. 
So also the term secret as part of government's toolkit tells us that the military interpreter is the holder of various kinds of secret which tend to endow him with some kind of power and reveal him, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the German officer, as a central person on the stage. All four types of secrets delineated earlier apply to the military's interpreter's staging. The strategic secrets point to his alleged loyalty to the Wehrmacht, its alleged loyalty, of course, by appealing to the officer's insisting question, referring to Mikhail's last words before being murdered, long live Soviet Ukraine. In the course of his performance, the interpreter is provided with entrusted secrets, which are typical for his profession as a military interpreter. In the present context, this means that the interpreter obviously understood Mikhail's message at the moment of his death and positions himself on the side of Mikhail's inmates. So these two types of secrets are opposed to another set of secrets, the dark secrets on the one hand, which undergo a shift as they refer to facts regarding the inmates as audience and not the performers. Not least having stayed together with Mikhail in the prison of war camp, they might know more about the motives to shout these words at the moment of his execution. And there are the inside secrets, on the other hand, which signify the interpreter's loyalty to the group of inmates. So, which results can we draw from this short analysis? The fact that Goffman linked his ideas to the uh, theatre context gives evidence of his faith that social agents can be seen as dramatic actors on a stage performing roles which are directly related to everyday life and which testify to the actor's drive for always controlling the pertinent situation. The consideration and the exclusion of the various secrets in the analysis, they amplify our perspective on the motives behind the agent's performance, not least because in the military context, in general, we have to do with a very high potential of secrets. And they help us disclose details on which stages appear as self-contained and which stages appear as systems which intersect with others. So to my opinion, the model is also striking for a very specific characteristic. It tries to go along without a macro history, without contextualizing in detail the situation to be analyzed, because very often in a historical context, this is just not possible. And it rather focuses on the situation, in our case, the interpreting situation during and after the prisoner Michael's execution. So the question which remains and which is very difficult to discuss, uh, but it might serve as a criterion for choosing a certain method is, of course, how far we can generalize our insights and adopt them, from, uh, adopt them to other analysis of interpreting or translation situations. So, by way of conclusion, I want to briefly discuss, very briefly discuss the question, what are the differences and what are the common features of the two models? Um, as far as the difference between histoire croisé and dramaturgical model is concerned, the histoire croisé approach draws our attention to the enlacements and to the various perspectives. It is always process-oriented, it involves the researcher and its focus is on the crossing and on the interlacement of perspectives of the situation to be analyzed. The dramaturgical model, on the other hand, foregrounds the position of the figure, of the figures involved, and the changing roles of these figures. It looks on the dynamics through this shifting and it points to the lack of relation between social roles. The focus is always on sh the shifting of roles and thus on the changed perspectives. As far as common features or features in common are concerned, uh, both do not analyze global structures 
such as nation, culture or yeah, society, and both focus very explicitly on the level of agents. Thank you very much.